Hello and welcome. We are some members of the Connect group here at Loughton Baptist Church. We are glad that you're joining us online and hope you are all able to join us on Zoom before the service. If not, you can find the details to join us next week. If you are new to us, click out the link in the description box below to find out more about our service, children's programmes and ways you can get involved. You can also find out more information by going to our website, loutonbaptistchurch.org. We will now continue our worship with some songs and the word of God. Who is moving on the waters? Who is holding up the Who is spinning back the darkness with the burning light of noon? Who is standing on the mountain? Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? the lover of my soul. Creator God is Yahweh, the great I am is Yahweh, the Lord of all is Yahweh. Rose of Sharon is Yahweh, the righteous son is Yahweh, the three in one is Yahweh.
We thank you for all women everywhere and those who follow you faithfully, for their service to you within the church, at home and in the workplace. Today we take time to thank our mothers and all they have done and continue to do for us. Help us to appreciate them and enable our relationships with them to grow. The past year has been especially challenging as mothers have adapted to the COVID-19 situation. For some, this has meant not seeing their children for a long period of time. God, we thank you that we can look forward to spending time together once again. For others, the challenges of homeschooling, work and home life may have left them weary. God be our refuge and strength. Some new mums adapting to the world of motherhood may have struggled with loneliness. God help us to remember that you are always by our side and encourage us as a church to support each of those who may be in need of comfort. For some, Mother's Day could be a challenging time. We pray for those who have lost children or lost their mothers and for those whose relationships with their mothers are strained or fractured in some way. We ask God that you would comfort them in their loss and bring healing and reconciliation through a work of your spirit. For those who hope to have children but face challenges, we pray that they would know your plans for them, plans to prosper them and not to harm them. Motherhood can be challenging as well as a great privilege and joy so strengthen all mothers today, giving patience and enthusiasm that they may teach their children your ways and reflect what it means to follow you. Let all be encouraged and given fresh vision of godly parenting, that we may be a Christian example to the rest of the world, reflecting the grace of God amongst us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us online this morning. Good to have you watching with us. Today we have a visiting preacher, but before I hand you over to them, I want to tell you about a project that all of us are invited to participate in over this Easter season. Because this Easter, we want to be able to tell others in our city of the hope of resurrection that is available, available to every one of us in Jesus Christ. We're planning to do this this year through a generous gift, what we're calling Hope Hampers. And we need your help. Two things that you can do for us over the next couple of weeks to be a part of this. Firstly, there may be families, older people, young people that you know outside of our church who have been particularly affected by this current pandemic. And to receive a hamper from us would bring more than a smile to them. It would stir hope within them. We need you to nominate households to be recipients of these gifts. Secondly, you may not be able to nominate anyone, but you do want to contribute financially towards the hampers. You can do that also. We'd love for you to pay for a family outside of this church to receive one of these gifts. So you can go to our website, loutonbaptistchurch.org, and find out how to do both these things and more about our Hope Hampers. Of course, we would love to do this for every household in our city, but sadly, that's not realistic. We're aiming for at least 40 hampers to be produced and would love as many of us as possible to be involved in this. So take the time to find out more. Any questions can go through the office or through our website and those who are planning this behind the scenes will get back to you as soon as they can. Thank you everyone for being a part of this. Let's be a part of this and see the hope that we can all bring as we share something of the Easter message with others in our city. to the Word of God. Now, if you've got a Bible with you, if you want to turn with me to the book of Luke, we're going to be in chapter 5 today, and we're going to read verses 1 to 11. So Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, this is what we read. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of the Gesserinet, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, 
and asked him to put out a little bit from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night and have caught nothing. But because you say so, I will let down my nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they had begun to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. So in the previous couple of chapters of Luke's gospel, we've seen Jesus introducing himself, if you like, and his ministry to this part of the world. And he's been amongst people who know him and also strangers performing miracles, identifying himself as the long-awaited Messiah, the person the Jews had been waiting for for centuries. And suddenly here is Jesus saying, the one that you've been waiting for, it's me. Well, that didn't go down too well with the Jewish Pharisees, if you like, the religious people of the time, but a lot of the ordinary people were absolutely captivated by Jesus, by not just what he said, but the way that he spoke, and particularly by the miracles that he performed. So when Jesus turns up at Lake Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee, there's a huge number of people that are crowding around him to, to, to listen to what he's got to say, but I believe also to maybe catch a glimpse of another little miracle. They're, they're fascinated by this travelling rabbi, this teacher, and they want to know more. So crowded is it on the shore that Jesus decides he needs to get a bit of distance between himself and the crowd. And the way that he decides he's going to do that is to get into a boat and to sail just a short way out from the shore so they can still hear him teach, but he's not as crowded. And so he jumps into this boat that just so happens to be owned by this guy called Simon. Coincidence? To be honest with you, I'm not sure that much Jesus did was ever coincidence. But have you ever thought, I mean, what if he'd gone to a different part of the shores of Lake Gennesaret? where it wasn't Simon's boat, it was, I don't know, it could have been no other fisherman's boat, who spent most of his time building the boat and not a lot of the time fishing, or, or old Jonah, who didn't catch much, but when he did, he used, it was always a big fish that he brought back. It could have been some other part of the lake, but no, Jesus went to this part of the lake where Simon was. For those of you that, that aren't familiar with the story, Jesus would rename this character Simon as Peter, and he's about to become a rather important person in the story of God and in the birth of Christianity, of the Christian church. So no mistake that it's Simon's boat that Jesus jumps into. And then to this apparently random, very ordinary, rough around the edges fisherman says, can you just push off the boat a little bit and, and then we'll sit and I will teach these people, which he does for a while. Gets to the end of the teaching on this apparently ordinary day where Simon and his fishing partners, James and John, possibly a few other crew members, have been sat on the, on the beach cleaning nets. And he says to this rough and ready fisherman, I want you to go fishing again. Go a little bit further into the lake, throw in your nets because I want you to fish. Bit odd, to be honest. I mean, as Jesus arrived at the side of the lake, he would have seen that they were cleaning their nets. But clearly, they'd just come back from night fishing and, and they were packing up. So Jesus asking them to go fishing again doesn't seem to be the obvious thing to do. And, and Simon politely tells Jesus that, look, it's not been a good night out on the lake. We've tried our best 
and we've caught nothing. These experienced fishermen, knowledgeable about this particular lake, had spent a whole night there and caught nothing. There was clearly no fish to catch just at the moment, so why do it? I think if Jesus had just been some ordinary character, Simon the rough and ready fisherman might have gone into, I imagine, fisherman's colloquial language of the time and suggested where Jesus might like to get off before surfing him over the side of the boat type of thing uh, and probably sending a text to James and John back on the beach you know he wants me to go fishing again for fisherman's sake or some other abbreviation you know crazy rabbi emoji or whatever it is that they might have done at that point in time instead though Simon says yes to Jesus there's something about this character Simon even calls him master now he would have probably had some respect for travelling rabbis, and Jesus was clearly one of, one of them. But still, there was something about this character that led Simon to put in the nets again. And then this most incredible thing happens. As he pulls the nets in, he can't because they're so heavy. So laden are they with the fish that he was sure were not there. What has just happened. Coincidence? Not sure that anything that Jesus did was ever coincidental. No, this is something that Jesus did that opened Simon's eyes to who it was who was in his boat that day. So big was the catch, he had to call back for the other boat, James and John's boat, to come and help him get all the fish in because there were so many of them at that particular point, the, the, the nets that were full. What a haul. What a miracle. We're not told whether the crowd on the beach who'd been listening to Jesus teach them had dispersed by that stage. We don't know whether they, they saw what had happened, and, and probably even if they did see what had happened, they probably wouldn't have got the significance of it because they probably didn't realise that these fishermen had been out all night and caught nothing. So just the immensity of what happened was probably only known to Jesus and the fishermen. So why did Jesus do it then? What's the point of the miracle? I mean, most of the other things that Jesus did, both in the previous chapters and in other places, the vast majority of them there was some public recognition of. Not always. I mean, even in this chapter, Jesus heals someone and says, don't tell anyone else, which of course is exactly what they do. And so word of Jesus spreads, but this particular miracle is really only known to Jesus and the people in the boats. Why did Jesus perform this miracle? Well, the, the first reason, I think, is because Simon's eyes are open to who he is. Simon goes from calling him respectfully master to Lord. Simon falls on his knees before Jesus and says, Lord, Lord. I wonder whether there are moments in our lives where something happens and we know that God, the extraordinary God, has invaded our ordinary lives with some moment that has opened our eyes and suddenly we realise that this person is the Lord, the Messiah, the one that we have been waiting for. That was the eyes of Simon opened. It, it was the first of several times where Simon managed to recognise who Jesus was properly, when apparently those religious experts of the law around and about refused or couldn't see who Jesus was. But I think that there might be some other reasons as well why Jesus did this miracle. Because in opening his eyes, Simon suddenly realises his own condition. Lord, he says get away from me, I am a sinful man. Suddenly, Simon realises that he's far from perfect. In comparison to the, the one who is in the boat, Jesus, he suddenly has a sense of, a, I am far from right. I am far from perfect. I'm a sinful man. You might have expected Jesus to say, you know full well you are, my friend. But he doesn't. And Jesus doesn't condemn people ever in that way. 
What Jesus does in this situation is as Simon recognises his sinfulness, bowed low before Jesus the Lord, Jesus the Lord says to Simon, you've got a new vocation. You can do something different. He offers him a different way of life, a purpose in life that he'd never known before. Don't be afraid, says Jesus. When we encounter Jesus, when we encounter God, it sometimes is almost like we want to back off and run away. Jesus invites exactly the opposite. Don't back off, come close, says Jesus, both to Simon that day and to us today. Come close, walk with me, follow me. And then Jesus uses this phrase, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch people, is what I believe to be just about the most accurate translation of the original language. From now on, you will catch people. Peculiar, strange thing to say. I mean, kind of makes sense in the context of fishing, doesn't it? But if we press the metaphor too much with the cold people and fish thing, we probably find ourselves in the wrong place. Maybe a, a better way to understand this is to see what Jesus says as a play on words. We've been catching fish, now we're catching people. If, if I was going to paraphrase it slightly differently, if I were so bold to paraphrase Jesus' words, maybe he's saying, from this point of your lives onwards, you will help me to catch those who are falling. You're going to help me to rescue people. That's what he's saying to Simon and to the other fishermen that day. Does, does that sound familiar to any of you? Particularly those of you who've read the previous chapter. Those of you that are part of Hope Baptist Church and were here last week will have heard this last week. Because Jesus identifies his mission from the words of Isaiah that we read of in Luke chapter 4. To proclaim good news to the poor freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. What Jesus is doing when he asks Simon and the others to be people catchers is to join in his mission, that mission, and that gives huge purpose in life for the future. And then the final response that we read about in this particular passage is that of Simon, James and John, maybe some of the other fishermen in the crew. Almost in passing, we're told something massive. So they pulled up their boats, left everything and followed Jesus. They, they what? They, they did what exactly? Because it's all right, you see, seeing the miracle, isn't it? It's all right kind of getting that Jesus is the Lord. Lovely, my friend. Off you go. We'll be thinking of you, praying for you. Your mission, crack on. What their response was, was almost so obvious to them that it gets one sentence in Scripture, but which, if this happened today, people would write books about their story. People have written books about their story, right? We don't, we don't get quite the book, the, the Simon's autobiography at all in this sense, but what we do get is this phrase, that they pulled up their boats, left everything, and followed Jesus. They're not alone. Later in chapter 5 of Luke, we read about Levi, the tax collector, who also left everything and followed Jesus. And we read about more disciples in the chapters that are to come. They're a pretty rough and ready bunch. They're, they're all sinners by their own admission. And often the Pharisees are there pointing the finger publicly and telling the world that they're sinners as well. They're not the obvious choices. Yet these are the people who Jesus calls to be his disciples. 
It's tempting to think, as, as some did at the time, that Jesus was gathering these folks almost like an army, you know, rough and ready fishermen and all the rest of it, a, a, a bit of a security uh, guard to protect him as he was going about his ministry or, or for some other self-serving purpose. That's why Jesus was asking all these people to follow him. Let's be very clear about this. Jesus gathers his disciples not because he needs them, but because they need him. Always, always, Jesus calls people to follow him, not because he needs your company, or your money, or your apparent gifts and talents. He'll choose to use all of them if you make them available, but that is not a need that the Almighty God has of you or anyone. Sometimes I'm tempted to think, God Almighty, we are making such a pig's ear of this, you're probably better off on your own. And still the call of Jesus is, follow me. Why? Well, because it's not about us. Jesus doesn't need us, but we so desperately need him. We need to accept that invitation to walk with him, to, to, to learn from him, to observe how he lived, to follow not just physically in his footsteps, but in terms of our attitudes to life, our priorities in life, our, our actions, the way that we respond, particularly in tough times. That's why we so desperately need to be followers of Jesus. Sinners, yes, but sinners whose lives are changed as we choose to follow him and learn a new way of living and discover a new purpose in life. I want us to note just a couple of things that I think are pretty common to all the disciples that Jesus calls in scripture and I think pretty common to most of us who he's calling today. Firstly, these are an ordinary bunch of people going about their daily business. If you were putting together a crack troops of missionaries wanting to introduce a whole new way of living, a whole new faith system called Christianity to a world that, that had no knowledge of it, your obvious choices would probably be a group of young, enthusiastic rabbis or some such who knew a little bit about scripture already. They'd been to Bible college, they'd got the qualifications, they'd learnt some of the skills and they were already respected in their communities. They would be the people who you would choose, surely, if you were going to introduce this whole new faith system, this whole new way of being to a world. You would choose them, wouldn't you? Apparently not. Apparently, the people that Jesus chose were the kids that were the last one to get picked in the schoolyard for the game. That was who Jesus chose. Those that no one else could see, or if they did see them, they used to smirk at the tax collector, or the smelly fisherman, th th those that weren't particularly well-educated by and large. Those were the people who Jesus chose as his crack group of disciples. And through them, he introduced a whole new way of being, a whole new faith system, Christianity, the only right way to live with God. That's who he chose, those group of people to be those who would follow him and then introduce to the world. The second thing I think that's common to all who follow Jesus is that like Peter's eyes were opened and he calls Jesus Lord, so it is with all those who follow Jesus. They don't necessarily know everything there is to know about him. They might not know a lot about him, at the point at which God calls them to follow. But what they absolutely do is they obediently respond, recognising who it is that's calling them. This is the Lord. 
They wouldn't just have upped and left everything and followed just anyone. And even in first century Palestine, there were plenty of charlatans around who could go and do a magic trick or could influence a crowd and then brainwash them so that this crowd of people would follow them. Well, this group of disciples required something more and it was the Son of God. The next thing is that as Jesus invited them to follow, they responded with a yes. Well, at least most of them did. Because there were some amongst their number who didn't, Jesus invited others to follow him and the cost was too great. And they said no. And they walked away. Just because Jesus invites you to follow doesn't mean that you have to. Even if you recognise who Jesus is, you can still walk away. Why? Well, because all those that followed Jesus paid a great cost for following. We've just heard of these fishermen. They left everything and followed Jesus. They left everything behind. Being a follower of Jesus is always costly. One of the books that's had the greatest impact on my life and my faith has been a book that's been written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer called The Cost of Discipleship. Some of you may have read it, and if you've not, if you're brave enough, get yourself a copy and read it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian who lived through the Nazi occupation of Europe in Germany and ended up dying just before the liberation of Europe in a concentration camp. But over those years, he wrote the most profound things, letters that have been published and, and this book that talks about what it means to follow Jesus. I would go as far as to say that if you're a follower of Jesus and it's not costly, you're doing something wrong. It's so much a feature of following Jesus. Now, this is hardly a selling ploy, is it? As far as marketing goes, this wouldn't be right top of the list of good marketing technique. But we're not trying to market a product. We're talking about following a person, about a different way of living. And if following Jesus isn't costly, why not? Pretty much it is for every single one of the disciples in Scripture. The next thing to note is that the call to follow Jesus is absolutely always a missionary calling. Jesus doesn't appear to be in the habit of calling people to follow him and then saying, you guys, we want you to be the prayers. Prayer team, that's you. Just pray. That's it. Nothing else. Just pray. All right? and, and, and you guys over there, well, we want you to be hospitality team. Now, hear me right, I'm not saying that prayer and hospitality are not mission. They both potentially are. But what Jesus calls people to is not to then hive them off into little groups of speciality. He calls them to be a follower of him and join him in his mission. The definition of a disciple of Jesus is someone who is joining him in his mission. There is no such thing as a non-missionary disciple of Jesus. The question therefore is, what does that look like for me and for you? Because if we're followers of Jesus and therefore God calls us to be missionaries, to whom and how? And only ever empowered by the Spirit of God to be able to fulfil that task. But that is central to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What they did, though, is experience the most profound purpose in life. I believe we still do today. If you decide to follow Jesus, it might be costly, but you will have that most profound sense of purpose. Following Jesus 100% answers the existential questions of life that I believe most people in this world have been asking more than ever in the last 12 months. Why am I here and what am I here for? Why am I here and what am I here for? It's questions where, if people are honest, it's gone through their minds, even in these last weeks over this lockdown in the UK. What's 
the point of me? Jesus gives these guys a reason for being, a reason for living, the best purpose in life ever. It's not an easy life. In fact, for the disciples in Scripture, it got a whole lot more difficult. I suspect for some of us today, we could tell similar stories when we've chosen to follow Jesus. But they did experience life in all of its fullness. Life in all of its fullness, or to to quote the maybe not quite up-to-date phrase that some of the younger people use, they've been living their best life, right? That's what is on offer here. Jesus offers the opportunity to you to live your best life. But please hear me, that doesn't mean it will be without problems or challenges or difficulties or pain or sorrow. Those things will happen just as they do to anyone else. But you will do those things walking alongside Jesus, knowing the strength that comes from him and his spirit, being able to face those things in a way that you would never have thought possible before you had met Jesus and chosen to follow him. That's what is on offer. As we close, I want just to ask a couple of questions. So what about you? Are you a follower of Jesus? Maybe today, as you have been listening, you've experienced the online equivalent of witnessing a miraculous catch of fish. At least in as much as, as you've heard the Bible read to you today, as you've heard this interaction of Jesus with ordinary people, your eyes have opened to who Jesus is, as they did for Simon. And you suddenly see the Lord, the one who you've been looking for. Some of you may have been searching for the one, the thing in life, for years, and thought you'd found it many times, and been disappointed many times because you haven't found it. This morning, the one who is utterly dependable, the only one who can satisfy that craving, that yearning, that searching, offers you the opportunity to follow him and to give you the purpose in life, the people-catching mission that he invites the disciples to is the same one that you're invited to today. So, So how will you respond? And for some, maybe in the past you have followed Jesus, but for all kinds of different reasons, you've stopped. That sense of following Jesus is something that is historic and doesn't describe your present experience. But this morning, you hear the voice of Jesus calling you to follow him again. Look, you aren't alone if that's you. What's really interesting about this passage from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry that we read of in Luke 5 is that in a different gospel, John's gospel, we read a very, very similar story about a miraculous catch of fish right at the end after Jesus has died and been resurrected. But before the disciples really know that, they have pretty much given up. Interestingly, Simon, now called Simon Peter, has gone back to what he knew before. He's gone back to fishing. And Jesus rocks up and tells them to throw in their nets. And they catch a miraculously huge haul of fish when they were struggling to catch anything before. Look, some Bible scholars will say this is the same story, but the two authors of the different Gospels have remembered it in different places. I don't agree. I don't agree. There's too many differences between the stories and it's too profound a difference. I think Jesus did it again. I think at the point of the disciples giving up, Jesus rocks up, opens their eyes again to who he is and then significantly in John's Gospel, chapter 21, also then says to Simon, follow me. Gives him a sense of purpose in life. Feed my sheep. And then he says, follow me. If you did walk with Jesus, but that doesn't describe your existence this morning, hear me, 
the voice of God calls you to follow him again, it's okay to recognize that you're not alone. It's not okay just to ignore the offer to follow him. This story from Luke's gospel that we've read this morning literally changed the lives of those fishermen. It's the same life-changing offer that Jesus makes to you today. You can choose how to respond to it, but the offer is there. Can I pray for us now? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, Lord, and I thank you for the way that it speaks to us, Lord, words of life, but also words of challenge. Lord, for those of us who've never walked with you before, who've never followed you, Lord, as we sense your call to follow you this morning, Lord, we want to respond with a yes. Lord, we recognise that um, that's a big deal. We recognise that admitting that we're far from perfect takes quite a bit of courage. But Lord, we know, God, that as we follow you, you offer us, Lord, the, the very best of life, a purpose in life. Lord, a real sense of living life to the full. Lord, we, we recognise the hardships in this world, but Lord, we want to walk through those difficult times with you. Lord, we choose to follow you. And for, for those amongst us who have followed you in the past but aren't at the moment, Lord, help us not to feel any sense of shame or embarrassment for coming back to you and saying, Jesus, I want to follow you again. Spirit of God, may this morning your warm embrace enfold those people. That sense of like a prodigal son returning to a father and just being held and with that huge sense of compassion and love. May that be known by those returning to you even now in these moments. And Lord, for those of us who you call from the, the place that we are, from the thing that we're doing to serve you in your mission in a different way, Lord, we, we don't know what that is right at this moment, but Lord, see our hearts as willing to hear from you, to explore with you and walk with others to explore what that might look like in the future. Quite simply, Jesus, we recognise in these days the need that this world has for something, someone, that will offer them hope, that will offer them life, that will offer them purpose, that will offer them meaning. And Lord, we recognise that long as we search, the only one who can fill that particular need is you, Jesus. So today, as we respond, Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Thank you for watching. Why not grab a drink and join us on Zoom for virtual tea and coffee? See you soon. Peace. Bye. 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 <laughs>